Friends, welcome to another episode of Work Life Play. Today, my guest is Scott Teams, friend and brother, lives in the last man standing town of Los Angeles with a passion for storytelling through films. So today we talk about his world of Hollywood and TV as a writer, producer, and director, and what it's taken to get here. So he has some upcoming really cool things that you'll see in the the big screen, the big studios. He has uh, one film that's coming out later this year, Halloween Kills, and actually in the fall of 2021. And he was a screenwriter for the Stephen King adaptation, Firestarter, that will be out in 2022, starring Zac Efron. He has other films that he has done, his private films, which we talk about. And as a course of the episode today, you'll hear cool drop-ins cut from those films that he talks about today. You can see him on IMDb and all of his profile and resume and all that lovely stuff. Definitely check out the show notes here on the episode under Work Life Play because you'll find all of the links especially to the films that we talk about of The Quarry, That Evening Sun, and Holbrook Twain, which are all private films that he has been the creator behind. Lots of other people, I'm sure, helped make that happen, but he's the guy who wrote these stories and brought them to life. Friends, I know you'll enjoy today. You can do this. This is good for you. Keep going with Scott Teams. ago we were at your house um you were barbecuing some burgers on the back patio mm-hmm. and i remember that you said i was just curious and asking you like man how do you how do you do this how do you become a director how do you move from you know film school to actually in the world of doing it making movies for a living and i remember one of the things that you said was basically you just i'm willing to go a long, 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 long way in the equivalent of like eating rice and beans to just right. make it and just to tough it out. And most people quit sooner. So take me to that. I don't know if you remember that conversation or not, sure. or if that was something that you said repeatedly, but take us to that of back in the day when you were in the, the theme of rice and beans, yeah. really to tough it out put up with more than most people. What did that look like back then? Uh, what it looked like was a strong belief in, in what I was trying to do. Um, a, a wife and family who shared that belief, which is a critical component <laughs> above all else, really. Um, uh, you know, I think if I... If, if my goal was to just make cool stuff or or blow up crap on screen or just like make money, um, I, I wouldn't have blasted the years and years it takes to forge a career in this business. But I did believe deeply that the stories I wanted to tell had value and, and, and purpose in the world if I could ever tell them and have that opportunity. Um, and my wife, TJ, she, she believed that too. And, and went on this journey with me and my, my promise to her was that I would surround myself with people who were brutally honest with me, that I would do my best to be self-aware and understand if I, if my dreams were, (laughs) were, were reasonable or if my dreams not reasonable they're never reasonable if my if i had any kind of talent that might possibly lead to this i would try to make sure i wasn't blind and i wasn't ignorant to who i was as a young artist and if i had any chops or if i was developing those chops and my promise was i wasn't going to sink the ship you know um but i believed that this passion that I had to tell stories um, was from somewhere and it had some purpose and value and meaning and, and I needed to pursue it. And she, and she agreed and she supported that. And, and um, you know, we left Georgia and moved to New York city and, and uh, 
as young college grads and jumped in with both feet and ended up here in LA eventually. And um, I, I learned pretty early on, I began to see the transient nature of this place, Los Angeles, and and the world of people who wanted to write and direct. Um, I began to believe deeply that and seeing evidence that if you did have the means to to hang around, if you had the will if you, <laughs> to mm. endure, then um, this is a last man, last person standing kind of town. Um, I think if you can hang around, if you have some kind of talent, if you're willing to put the time in, then you will ultimately build your circle big enough to where someone somewhere can read it, someone with that, that can actually do something with it or that can lead you toward someone who can do something with it. You know, the best advice I ever got, I took a writing class when I moved to New York right after I got there. I have these wonderful teachers, uh, Chris and Kathy Riley, who are screenwriters, and they said to us that class, because we had moved there sort of naively. We had thought, hey, we're going to go up, give us two or three years. By then, we'll sort of know if this is something that can happen. You know, this is this is 20 years ago. So it was, there wasn't a big internet community. There wasn't a lot of places to get information about. What's life like for the screenwriter in New York or LA? Like, what's the sort of What's the reality of it? So I thought rather naively that if you go up there for a couple of years, you'll know if you're going to make it or not, two, three years. And we took this class and they said, for everyone they know who has made it, and by making it, they simply meant someone who earns their living primarily as a writer or only as a writer. That's their qualification for making it. For everyone they know who's made it, it took them 10 years before they were sustaining based only on their income as a writer. So they said, if you can sit here now, this is 2001. If you can sit here in 2001 and say, in 2011, you will sell your first script or to anyone out there wanting to write today. If you can sit here and say, in 2030, you're going to sell your first script. If that excites you, if that does not seem like a long time to you, then maybe maybe you have the, what it takes to do this. And that was incredible because... That the scales fell from my eyes, and I was able to go home and say, Okay, TJ, like this is actually going to be more like 10 years. Is that something we are willing to do together? You know, and instead of like, we, we, so, so what it did is it helped us to properly calibrate our expectations. And that is, that is the goal of life. That, that's, that's the key to, to life, in my experience. Is, properly calibrated expectations and uh and and in and, and relationships and in certainly in work and in, in your dreams and knowing what to expect and making sure everyone's seeing you know has the same expectations who's involved that that's the key so i just read and I keep rereading actually uh palmer parker book titled let your life speak in one of the phrases that he uses i think he actually borrows it from someone else but this idea of being fierce with reality hmm. i like that i like that yeah that's cool i'm fierce with reality and my feet are grounded in the truth mm. yeah uh, with properly calibrated expectations so that was 2011 you're coming up on you're at 19 years before we get to what today's like for you, I'd like to go back to something you said earlier, which was you felt that you had stories in you that were worth telling and sharing with the world. So what are the kinds of stories that are in you that are worth sharing with the world that you can't not tell? It's a good question. I mean, I don't even know that it was so much about the stories that are inside me, meaning that are unique to my self. I, in fact, most of the work that I've done has been adapting source material um, to create films out of short stories or novels or comic books. I've done all of those things. What I knew was that I wanted to find those bits because I've never been a big idea person. I've never been the guy who has three good story ideas a day 
mm. like some of my friends do, who I loathe. You know, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> they make me angry. If I get one good idea a year, I feel like that's a, a win, you know. So I, I look for inspiration in source material that can then, I can then draw part of myself out and, and pour that into that story and then create this third thing through the medium of film. So, so what, what it was, I think, was a passion for storytelling um, with moving pictures and wanting to, to tell stories about the things I was passionate about, which broadly speaking are men, violence, the South, and religion, faith, and where those things intersect, collide. I've done lots of other things, but those are the passions that I, that sort of define my sort of the person I was and the person I'm becoming, the product of the South, wanting to tell stories about where I come from, you know, as my relationship with that place evolves and changes over my lifetime. Knowing that the medium of film was something that I found incredibly powerful, that I felt like I had a gift for, and that I wasn't seeing a lot of stories about the South told authentically. Um, a lot of stories about faith told authentically. I wasn't seeing those stories as many as I'd like to see. It was more about these big ideas that I wanted to wrestle with. And I knew those ideas were things that everyone wrestles with. You know, we all wrestle with where we're from. We all wrestle with, is there God? Is there no God? What does it mean? Is there meaning to life? Mm -hmm. The, 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 the impulse of man toward violence. These are, you know, all humans wrestle with these ideas, hopefully, or at least you're, you're impacted by these ideas and themes. So it was more thematic um, for me than any specific sort of set of ideas for stories that I had. I had to kind of find those stories that could then allow me to, to investigate and wrestle with these ideas. One of the things that you said another conversation we had years ago was, and really I've retold this numerous times, is that you love to tell stories and that in dramas, the best stories are where everyone's the good guy and everyone's the bad guy. Take us into that idea. Where did you discover that and how does that inform how you tell stories as well as how you view your own life. Yeah, I mean, I think I was blessed or cursed as it may be with a, a pretty stiff BS detector and um you know, <laughs> and I think authenticity is something that I value and uh, a lot in my life and my relationships. And to look authentically at the world is is to realize there are no there are no good guys or bad guys. Everybody's a little gray. And the, tr the, mm. the challenge with a lot of storytelling at the, at the level of like Hollywood movies where you have, you know, there's so many different factors involved, which is, and primarily it's financial, right? So you, these are movies that, these are small businesses someone's creating around this story, mm -hmm. you know, investing millions of dollars. They want it pretty clean and simple and not, and in, in order to attract the largest audience, obviously. But those movies never really appealed to me. The largest sort of big budget action figure hero, superhero movie kind of thing. But only in so much as it reveals some, some element of human nature. But in terms of just guys in white hats and guys in black hats, I'm just that's not the way the world works. That's not the way I experience life. And so it's not the kind of stories I want to tell. And... And so as I, as I look for stories that interest me, I'm drawn to, to those kinds of tales where, where the lines aren't so clearly drawn. For example, my first film is called That Evening Sun. It's about this man who's in a nursing home and decides he doesn't want to be there anymore. So he walks out one day and catches a cab back to his farm in the middle of Tennessee, only to discover that there's someone living there, that his son has leased the farm out from underneath him. And, um, and so the old man gets really mad, moves into a little shack on the property and says, I'm not leaving until I get my farm back. We rented this place from your son. Been here going on three months. I was hardly gone three months. Well, we got the papers. 
and everything. We thought she's in the old folks' home over in Perry County. I was. I ain't no more. So it sets up this showdown between the old man and this new guy who's sort of this, you know, ne'er-do-well, what you might call a white trash guy who the old man hates. You've been trying to start a fight with me ever since you set foot on this land yesterday. I ain't trying to fight you, Choke. Just claiming what's rightly mine. This is my land now, Meacham. Can you understand that? And I can do with it what I want to, when I want to. I can paint this house. I can raise any harvest. I can, I can, I can bathe in that big tub and lay in that soft bed and can't nobody tell me different. Not you, nobody. And that just eats you up, don't it? It just claws on your insides. That's what you work for in this life, Meacham. Land. To have a home. To be a landowner. And I'm the goddamn landowner now! How do you expect to run a farm this size when you can't even keep the lawn mowed? Grin over your head, son. And what's great about that setup is that the audience initially identifies and and gets on the side of the old man who's had this thing taken from him. He's got this moxie. He like walks out of the nursing home. He's smart. He's sharp. He's strong. He gets to this farm and takes a stand against a guy who has every right to be there, <laughs> who has if, who has done nothing wrong except pay for this place and legally in a legal transaction with the, with the son. And as the old man fights for this place, you understand exactly why he's doing it, you know, right? It's, 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 his, it's his home and it's where his memories are. It's where his wife died. But you realize he's also, you know, for all his strength, he's also callous and he's cruel and he looks down upon the man and he only sees the world th through one point of view, his own, you know. And then the son is also right in his point of view because the son, that he didn't, the dad can't really live on his own. And that's revealed as the movie goes along. Your mother loved that farm. She loved you. And I loved her too, Dad, and I always will. You won't throw all that away for a little bit of money. I never taught you to be greedy. You learned that somewhere else. This is not about greed. There's nothing out there for you anymore, Dad. Things change. Life goes on, and you got to go on with it. There ain't any more to it than that. Life goes on, huh? For those who let it. I'm an 80-year-old man with a bum hip and a weak heart. How much life do you think I got left to go on with? I'm no fool, Paul. The road ahead ain't long and it ain't winding. It's short and straight as a goddamn poisoned arrow. But it's all I got. And I deserve to do with it as I please. And what makes me so angry is that I cut and scraped and did without so that you could go to an expensive school and learn a trade which you now seem intent on using to do me out of what has taken me a lifetime to accumulate. This must be God's finest joke. He perhaps didn't go about it the right way, but the son also has the right point of view. So all three men in this scenario are, quote unquote, right in their own position. And I love that where everyone's right and everyone's wrong. And so what happens then can be more authentic as those people clash together. Um, we see different sides of their humanity reveal and the good guy's not as good as you think he is and revealed, and the bad guy's not as bad as you think he is. And ultimately, you see that they're a lot more like each other than you were initially set, uh, believed at the beginning. And that's what I think is the human experience, right? I got a friend of mine, Gareth Higgins, who says, for almost everyone you meet, like your whole opinion of them could be changed for better or for worse if you knew one more piece of information about them, you know? And that, that one thing you don't know about their life, about where they are, about that day, what happened that day to them or didn't happen that day to them. Um, or as my wife so eloquently puts it, no one's a bitch for no reason. I mean, that's, that's the truth. And that's what I love about stories revealing parts of our nature. Uh, that's what draws me to it. Another thing that you said, and it was specifically to one of your newer mm -hmm. films, Holbrook Twain was you said something to the effect of the movie won't come to you. You have to go to it. 
I, I think what I heard you saying and then having watched mm -hmm. it was that you have to make a conscious choice to engage this mm -hmm. film. It's not like a back to the Marvel right. comic. It's not a Marvel comic blockbuster right. that's going to draw you in with entertainment. You have to approach it with like, I'm looking for the treasure here. So tell yeah. me about that. And all, all three of my movies have an element of that. I think meaning on its most basic level, they're quieter films. They're restrained. I think what happens is a lot of movies talk at you and, and I'm trying to talk with you. I guess. I mean, this is all the way I'm saying all of this sounds pretty pretentious when he's when you say it out loud. But I'm what I'm trying to do is get you to engage. You know, I'm I'm just trying to get you to engage. You know, so it's it's really about I'm not going to yell at you. I want to have a dialogue. I want you to think about what you're watching, and that's easy to when, when you describe it. I can imagine people rolling their eyes or saying this sounds very boring. And I don't think these movies are boring. They're just patient, and they just. Um, they just, you know, need you to pay attention. You know, it's, um, uh, you know, this great filmmaker, Robert Brisson, this French filmmaker, he, he would call, you know, a lot of modern movies, the cinema of inattention, you know, and you just, you wouldn't, you don't pay, you don't have to pay attention because the movies just talk at you. And, um, and it's entertainment and it's, and it's, and it's a distraction and there's nothing wrong with that. And I certainly enjoy those movies too. Um, I think when you're, tr when you're reaching for bigger ideas, sometimes you have to, you know, it requires more patience for the viewer. And, um, but what I look for are these great premises, like I just described with, with that evening sun, you know, it's like, um, you set up this, this great hook, a guy moves back to his house, somebody's living there, right? Boom. Now you have a great hook. You know, you're headed toward a confrontation, there's going to be some showdown happening yeah. in this into this movie, yeah. and so that creates a tension inside that space that creates opportunity for patience. Same thing with the quarry, my latest movie, which you know uh, uh, a man rolls into town, stranger rolls into town, claiming to be someone he's not. Where are you from, Reverend? Originally, where did you grow up? Ohio. Oh yeah. You ever live in a town like this? Small town? People think they got charm, you know? Everybody knows everybody. One bar, one grocery, one pizza joint. That creates tension. When's he going to get found out? What's going to happen when he is found out? So you know you're headed somewhere for some kind of confrontation, and that allows me the space to take the time to investigate character. So I'm always looking for that great hook. You know, Holbrook Twain's different. It's a documentary, mm -hmm. um, but you still are, are revealing this very interesting story of how it all came to be, you know, and um, our, a story that I find interesting, at least, about this, this, this great man's life, two great men, their lives, Mark Twain, Hal Holbrook, and how their lives have been forged together through Hal's portrayal of twain for almost seven decades on stage it was like 2200 yeah. times like yeah. the longest yeah. standing longest one man show, show or something yeah it's, it's it's phenomenal and that was an i was very honored and privileged to be asked to tell that story because it's one of the great works of american theater certainly in american art i think just what he built there and what he did from 1954 to nine to 20 17 when he finally retired so you know it's it's uh, incredible that's an opportunity that i had that i'm very blessed by if we want to know what the human race is truly like observe it at election time that's when the parade of half truth goes marching by <laughs> it's a monument to the gospel that truth is stranger than fiction the candidates rearrange the facts to suit themselves and keep the lies and the half-truths spinning in the air while the great gullible public cheers and shouts and stomps its approval the way they always do when a politician has just said something they don't understand. We can discount 90% of what the candidates say at election time and, and assign it to softening of the brain. 
because the contents of their skull could change places with the contents of a pie. <laughs> and nobody would be the worse off for it but the pie. There is not one brain among them superior to the rest. And yet this sarcastic fact does not humble the arrogance or diminish the know-it-all pronouncements of a single ignoramus among them. Narratively, in fiction films, the key for me is finding that hook that creates that tension because you know you're going somewhere. And that's the space that I like to build character. So you've done everything from producing, writing. For those of us that don't live in that world, kind of walk us through what's the difference of like being a writer on a team and doing screenplays? What's the difference between actually being a producer? What's the kind of just yeah. walk us through like the, the 101 and, and how, you, how you operate today and what's the difference between producing versus actually writing versus writing, producing all of it? Yeah. Today, it's sort of three parts to my career or what I do. My sort of primary work is I write. I'm a screenwriter for, for studio films. So I write for other directors to make movies. So I've been doing that for a while. Those movies are finally starting to get made and come out. Um, so I do it. And I, I ended up by circumstance and, and, uh, fortune sort of stumbling into the horror genre so i'll write a lot of horror movies which mm. i love as a as a expression of character and what's cool about genre um is that um uh you can just you have this sort of a more overt narrative drive whether it's a horror movie whether there's a someone stalking and killing whether there's ghosts whether there's like a thriller plot a police crime detective whatever it is you have a more of a overt narrative driving plot that pushes the movie along and uh, but you can still find space inside that for character which is what i love and try to do so for example i wrote the sequel to halloween it's called halloween kills it comes out in the fall of 2021 it's supposed to come out this fall but got pushed because of covid i wrote firestarter which is a stephen king adaptation that shoots next year it'll probably come out the year after that i got like two or three more studio films that will hopefully be arriving in theaters over the next two years and so that's one avenue and i'm just a writer on those and i work with the directors and i work with the studios i write and direct my own films uh, like The Quarry and That Evening Sun and Holbrook Twain. And so those are generally smaller indie films. And I consider that sort of my art. You know, I don't make a lot of those. They're hard to get made. It's hard to find somebody to give you three or four million dollars to tell a little story about it. an old man on his farm or a preacher in Texas, you know, who's not who he says he is. Those are smaller films. And so those are the things I treasured because that's my real expression as a director. But those don't come around that often. And I spend a lot of my off time just trying to make those happen, you know, and those take years. The quarry took 10 years to get made. You know, I worked on my documentary for eight years, you know, and so it takes a long time. And then I work in television. So as a producer and a writer and an occasional director, I worked on Narcos and I worked on the show called Rectify for several years. So it's allowed me just to bounce around and it keeps things fresh. You know, and so I spend most of my time the last few years just writing by myself in coffee shops and bars or on my back porch when the weather's right, you know, and uh, so I do that a lot. And then you go direct and that's a much more intense, you know, you spend four or five months in in Louisiana or Tennessee or wherever you're shooting, you know, you um, have that time to make that film and then you spend uh, several months editing the film, getting it ready. So the quarry, for example, I worked on for about 10 months. That was working on that from February to December of 2019. We worked on that film. And, um, and then in a, in a writer's room for television, it's a whole other experience. You get in a room with anywhere from six to 10 people, other writers, and you spend several months just every day together 
just thinking of ideas. You know, you sit in a room that's covered in in whiteboards and cork boards, and you just dream up the story for the season of TV, and and you come away, and then you once you have the story sort of mapped out, which you do as a group together, then you go off individually and write your episodes. And as a producer on that, producer in TV is different than a producer in film. A producer in film is the person who's really putting the whole thing together. They're they're getting the money from the financiers. They're assembling those deals. They're helping. They're hiring cast and crew, or the crew. You now the director casts the movie. The producers helping hire the crew, putting the whole the the physical making of the movie, the logistics of making the movie. The producer is is the one most often who's handling all of that. A producer is a nebulous term. It means lots of different things. For for example, executive producer is usually limited to the financier. The per- per- person who put the money into it is the executive producer. Whereas the producer is usually the person who's hands-on logistical uh, oversight and making the movie. The director goes and directs the movie. And I'm often the writer and director on my own projects. Puts a bit of everything. So one thing I'm curious about, Scott, is if you were to name the muscle that enables for you to endure, and it's back to the the hamburger flipping conversation of just being willing to believe and and just keep going the distance. I, I just find that a really mm-hmm. unusual muscle mm-hmm. that you have. So how is it that you keep keep the faith, keep believing, keep going, keep doing, keep What's the resilience in you? Yeah, I mean, what I've discovered is I've really done self-analysis. There are things you can do that I did purposely to build those muscles, which is which is basically forming good habits, getting up early, forcing myself to get up early every day to show up and sit down at the computer uh, or at the desk and do the work. And some days there's nothing happens. Some days everything happens, but you have to just show up every day. And that's just basic. Any writing teacher or whoever will tell you that anything you want to pursue. If you want to be in shape, you got to show up and work out. Every, you got you to you jog every day. You got to do whatever. And those habits just take time and take discipline, but lots of, lots of people can form good habits. And I think to endure the writing of it is just to it's a combination of belief that, like I said, belief in what I'm doing. But honestly, <laughs> what I've realized over the years is that I'm incredibly fortunate in that I really, really deeply respect my wife. Yeah. And I do not want to disappoint her. <laughs> and I really, like, I have yeah. such a respect for her, you know, and um, I don't want to be the loser who 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 can't get his crap together and um who sinks the ship you know and i just want to show up for her Mm. and for my kids i mean i love my kids obviously but she was the one she was the first one and um and i just i i just i love her and i just want to (laughs) that is the truth is that she she rises me up you know i have to i have to rise up to her level and um just the way the integrity and the way she lives her life that's inspiring to me, and and uh, I want to show up for her, and and uh, the benefit then is as as I've I've gained throughout our twenty years of marriage. I've just you know a lot of this has been stuff that's been born from that relationship. This discipline, this drive, this fire. She helped me believe I could do it. You need somebody in your corner. You need somebody who believes in you. You believe in yourself, but you need somebody else who kind of affirms you. And uh, you need lots of people along the way, but, you know, she's the first. It's been fun to watch you guys do this dance together and watch you share this fervent belief that this is work worth doing. The lesson that I believe we can extract and highlight from the stories that you're sharing with us are the properly calibrated expectations gives everyone an opportunity to deal with reality. Mm -hmm. You know, in your case, it's um, the the story of, of Hollywood and, and film and production. And and I've witnessed it, the same story played out in, you know, business context. So it's a big building that they go to every day and a company and people that they lead. And, you know, it's a different context, but very similar story of, Okay, so this is my dream and I need everyone around me to help me make this happen. 
while everyone else's dreams, you know, whether go on hold or all the oxygen in the room and the resources are absorbed by making sure one person is successful in the story and the rest right. of the family is not. And right. that's a very repetitive version narrative that I watch people mm-hmm. about. But mm-hmm. this more what my buddy will call like the narrow road, you know, the, the, the path of life that few find, it does look differently. And this idea too of this kind of, I would just call it an everydayness muscle. If what you were saying is for both you and TJ, what's enabled for you to go the distance is 20, 19 years ago, having some real sobered realities. Mm-hmm. Of, this is actually what we're signing up for. This is actually what this will look like. And then how do we both actually live in such a way where we can get what we need for both in each other, our family, our careers, like just a lot of trade-offs. I find that not only do people not have the basis of clarity and that fierceness of reality from the very beginning, secondly, not having that partnership like you have with TJ Mm -hmm. uh, and I have together, not Mm -hmm. having that everydayness of the baseline of life-giving habits. I think a lot of people actually just believe there's a shortcut line, like a VIP line that they'll eventually, they'll eventually find it. Um, and occasionally people do, but I just noticed that those people don't seem to last either. They have other like unintended consequences, even if they do get the VIP line temporarily or some yeah. golden ticket. So it appears the ones that I admire most are the ones that it's built on foundations that are actually sustainable and life giving to all involved. Yeah, that's that's great. The other thing I see is there's a pull to to wait to really begin living your life outside of this thing. Like you want to put all your energy. And I've seen this happen too. I get here, I'm young, young and single, and I'm going to be a writer or a director or whatever. I'm an actor, I'm going to do whatever. And so I'm going to put life on pause outside of this pursuit to be, and then when I'm established, then I have time for, a family or whatever else. And when I'm, when I'm making my art on, on some sustainable level, the irony that I find in that is that the art inside of that small little window will never grow and be good enough to be sustaining if you're not living and having life experiences. Those experiences are what inform the art. You know, us, TJ and I having a kid uh, our first child, like when we're when we're broke, and I'm like, you know, working the, you know, the 4 a.m. shift at CBS News in New York City, you know, like getting up at 2:45 in the morning to go catch the subway, living in Queens, into town, like we were broke, and I had to like make some money, to, but we wanted to like start a family, and we wanted to live right now in that in that time and place, and. And it was scary, but I also know that it, I grew as a person so much through that experience, and um, it made my art better, deeper, richer. And those things then allowed, I, I believe, me to build as an artist more quickly. And and you know, and so as opposed to like just waiting to start a family until I had it all figured out. I mean, there's there's many ways to do it, but I just think for me. Uh, I see that happen too, and you you can you can miss out. The risk is that you can miss out on a lot of life experience by waiting around, and then with with no guaranteed result. Live your life; it makes you a better person and better artist. The beautiful thing about this story about getting my expectations recalibrated was that the first year that I survived solely on my writing was 2011, which was 10 years. After oh, I wow. heard that talk, that was the first year that I subsisted solely on my screenwriting. Um, and that was even after having made a movie like that evening sun came out in 2009. And but when you make a movie for a million dollars that, you know, that movie, it won lots of awards, had great success on the festival circuit, got me representation, all that kind of stuff. But that movie, you know, is a million dollar movie. So I made, you know, 20 grand on that movie like and over a five-year period so that's of the five years to make that movie i got paid twenty thousand dollars it's not going to pay your bills so you still have to find ways to survive throughout that whole time i was working and so it wasn't until 2011 
um, when I was able to get my first sort of studio screenwriting gig and that I sort of broke through to a level where I could live only on my, on my work. Friends, I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Scott Teams. And as you can hear, doing work we love isn't necessarily simple, short, easy. There's no VIP line to the front. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of prioritizing what matters most. Surrounding yourself with people who love you, support you, will tell you the truth. Showing up every day, doing the work, and being fierce with reality, as our friend Parker Palmer says. Bless you all. Enjoy. Keep going. Mm-hmm.